Um, so first of all, I just want to welcome everybody again. This is our one year anniversary. We should have a chin chin. We'll have to do that before we hang up. We can have a chin chin. Um, thanks to everybody who's been following along um, all this time. And thanks to all the folks who have joined in along the way. We're happy that y'all are here. Um, today, we are going to go on a virtual visit to the Veneto. Let's see, I'm going to share my screen. So Lorenzo's here as uh, usual, and feel free to um, write a question in the comment section and Lorenzo will either respond or he'll um, ask me and I'll respond. And then at the end, we'll open up microphones so everybody can um, ask questions. Hang on, I'm trying to get my screen set. Here we go. Let's see, if I go like that, I think I get a better view. Okay, how's that? Lorenzo va bene così, non c'è quella riga. Sì, un po' c'è okay, una bianca piccola sotto, ma va bene. Aspetta, lo, lo metto a posto. All right, so Lorenzo is here with okay. us, helping on the tech side. And as y'all know, he's also a chef, so feel free to ask questions. He can respond. And um, I am Elaine Trigiani. I'm an art historian. I used to work at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Um, and I've been living in Italy for 20 years working with um, food and wine tourism. And as uh, we just said, a year ago, we started doing these virtual visits. So since for the time, uh, for the time being, nobody can come to Italy to visit, we're doing virtual visits. Today, we're going to go to Venice. And on the right, you can see Venice is highlighted here. And we're going to talk about an artist called Giorgione. And he's from a town called Castel Franco Veneto, which is right here. I've also highlighted on the map Florence, because we're going to talk about um, high Renaissance art in Florence and some um, Florentine artists. And then the fourth little dot on the map is my house where I am. Y'all can see it here. Um, and here I'll just give you a quick view. So I live at the Castle of Popiano and I have some little, here we go. Um, my screen is doing funny things today. Castle of Popiano and I live just outside the castle walls down here to the left in this little house that y'all see behind me here. So today we're going to go to Venice and we're going to talk about um, the High Renaissance in Venice, which is right around um, the year 1500. So the artist we're going to talk about was born in about 17, excuse me, 1474 and moved to Venice and worked there. Venice is really particular because it was the um, head of this really mighty maritime empire. It's a republic that lasted for, I think, 1300 years. And at the height of their power, which was right about 1500, they actually controlled all of that territory that you see there marked in red. So clearly they're a maritime empire and they have all of these holdings um, which are kind of lining the, the Adriatic and the Mediterranean um, and even into the Black Sea. But they also have holdings on the mainland. You can see that here. And in fact, the artist called Giorgione was born in what was part of the um, Serenissima Repubblica, the most serene republic of Venice. So he was born a Venetian citizen. So here is Giorgione. Um, he was born Giorgio, which in um, the dialect of the Veneto is pronounced with a Z. So he was called Azorzo, and he was always referred to as Zorzo da Castelfranco. Not that there are many documents that refer to him, but in the few documents that do refer to him, he's referred to as Zorzo da Castelfranco or Zorzi. And then posthumously, about 50 years after his death, the first document shows up where he's called Zorzone, the great George, Giorgione. His impact was huge. Um, he died early. He was 36 years old when he died in 1510. He actually died of the plague, um, sort of the peste, the bubonic plague. It was a you know, terrible pandemic epidemic. And he unfortunately caught the plague from his lover, whoever she is, we're not sure. And they both ended up in the quarantena, the quarantine, on the Isola del Lazaretto Nuovo. So people who were sick and goods that were suspected to be contaminated with the plague were sent out into quarantena, which was actually a 40-day waiting period. Their quarantine was 40 days. That's, in fact, quaranta is the word for 40. So that's where we get our word for quarantine. Unfortunately, he, neither he nor his girlfriend made it. So he moved to Venice at a fairly young age. He was there for somewhere between 10 and 15 years um, before he died. And he made an absolutely huge influence. Um, so he died very young. There's hardly any documentation about him. And yet he really kind of changed the style of painting in Venice and eventually also in Italy. Um, he was known as a sort of a gentleman artist. He was a musician. 
he played the lute, he sang, he composed music. Um, and he was this kind of avant-garde, very innovative painter. Contemporary Italian artists call him, and they'll say he's an apri porta, he opens the doors. We would say he's a trailblazer. Um, and the way that he does that is kind of his painting style, which is tonalism, and we're gonna look at that pretty carefully. Um, the way he paints light, this is a, a self-portrait of Giorgione as the biblical hero, David. So the way he paints um, light and this kind of freedom he has in laying down paint, all with kind of characteristics that are very peculiar to Venice. So we're gonna look at that. So we'll talk about kind of his artistic heritage, where he came from, and then we'll look at his works and um, uh, the legacy that he left. So when he moved to Venice, he moved to the area called San Silvestro, which is right here where the red dot is. Um, that's actually the street he lived on there on the left. It's actually, it's, now it's a, a Rio Terra called Rio Terra San Silvestro. It was a canal back in uh, Giorgione's lifetime. It was filled in in the 1800s. So when Giorgione was here, you would see, you know, gondola would have been floating down the canal here. Um, you can see where he located it's in the uh, Fiere San Polo. And you can see that um, he is not too far from Rialto, the Rialto Bridge. This is a building here, it's a big square building with a courtyard, it's called the Fondico dei Tedeschi, and that's gonna be very important in his career, so remember that. And then you can also see um, the great square of San Marco, the Basilica of St. Mark's here, and then the Palazzo Ducale along the Bacino, um, the San Marco um, for this, in the city of Venice. So Ven Venice in this period was a very cosmopolitan city. There was a group of international intellectuals here participating in um, kind of these cultural salons that were held in the studiolo of um, the patric patrician ruling class. They were literally getting together. They were discussing philosophy, literature, classics, um, Italian poetry, visual arts. So Giorgiani was kind of a part of all of that. So these patrician members of Venice's ruling class were also creating their own art collections. So he was kind of hanging out with them, you know, discussing, you know, Greek philosophers, and they were um, commissioning photos, uh, excuse me, commissioning paintings from him. So those are kind of where his uh, patrons uh, fit into the social sphere in Venice. Venice itself um, really influences art in Venice just because of how the city is built on water and their kind of particular atmosphere. So there's all of that shimmering light, um, very particular quality to light. There's a very kind of this kind of palpable humidity in the air, which you can actually kind of affect how you know light hits objects. And then it's often very foggy. So the idea that contours are blurred is just part of everyday life in Venice. So that actually has just the geography of Venice actually has an effect on um, the art that was produced there. Um, the commercial and cultural interchange with the, um, the Levant and the Eastern Christian Empire really also kind of made for a very particular type of um, atmosphere, cultural atmosphere in particular in Venice. So there were, think about the presence of all of these people, diplomats, merchants, intellectuals as well, philosophers from Greece and the Levant were all here on site. Um, the art even took on kind of a Byzantine character. You can see that in the side of um, the Basilica of San Marco. The interior is covered with these Byzantine mosaics, which again creates this kind of a glow, um, which really creates kind of this almost mysterious atmosphere on the inside. So light is very important in Venice and in Venetian art as well. Here's a close-up of some of the mosaics. This is um, some scenes uh, from Mela and the art from um, the interior of San Marco. Byzantine mosaics are actually composed directly with colors. White plays a huge role, obviously, as we just saw. And then notice the broken surface. The testere are all inserted at different angles um, on purpose so that they can provide sparkle from every single available light source. That's why you get this kind of a great glow um, in every possible moment. So direct um, artistic heritage of Giorgione came through the great workshop of the Bellini family. This is an altarpiece by Giovanni Bellini. Um, so it, we think that, that Giorgione probably was in the workshop of the Bellini. There aren't any, there aren't any documents to that effect, but we, we can tell from his painting that he had uh, contact with them. We believe he was actually in the studio. So he may have actually helped on this painting. This is a triptych in the church called the Frari, which is um, not too far from uh, where 
um, Giorgione was living in the city. And again, this is Giovanni Bellini, a um, member of this kind of generational, very important um, art workshop. They became kind of the state painters. They were the official painters for the Venetian Republic. Um, you can see how he has used um, what he has on site, right? The Madonna is actually kind of ensconced in this niche with that beautiful mosaic half tone and that kind of glow coming out of there like we just saw from the interior of San Marco. And he's very interestingly managed to create the illusion of depth in that niche, not with dark shadows, but by actually using that glow of the light. He seems to have been well aware of what was going on in Florence. The high Renaissance, or the Renaissance, excuse me, was actually born in Florence. And he seems to have been well aware of that. This is a, a panel called a Sacra Conversazione. It's the Virgin and Child in the center with a group of saints. Um, the Madonna uh, and Child are on kind of a throne with these little angels at the bottom, which are forming a nice kind of triangular, kind of a solid triangular composition in the middle. These are hints that he definitely knew what was going on in, um, uh, in Florence, in central Italy. Another kind of aspect of Venice with um, the importance of trade is that artists in Venice had access to extremely rare pigments, kind of things that were rare and costly and hard to get a hold of came in first in Venice and they got their pick of those things. So just look at the lapis lazuli that was used there to make the robe of Mary. Things like that were kind of hard to come by and super expensive. Um, another thing is that they were painting in oils. Um, the oil painting technique spread throughout Europe from the Low Countries and came into Venice actually quite early. So um, this is a painting from about 1480, St. Francis in Ecstasy by Giovanni Bellini, painted in Venice. Today it's in the Frick Collection in New York. Um, he was painting in oils while um, most of the rest of Italy was still working in tempera and fresco. What's really cool here is how he is using light yet again. And oil paints really help um, kind of create that glow. You can just layer thin layers of paint that really uh, paint kind of goes, light will go in through paint layers, hit the ground and bounce back out. So you can kind of manipulate how light literally bounces out of your painting. Here, what he's done, this is 1480, relatively early. Um, historically, most images of St. Francis in ecstasy um, show a little figure of God or a cherub or even a little crucifix up here that's kind of making eye contact with uh, St. Francis. In this instance, the presence of God is represented by this mystical light. It's kind of this light of the sunrise that has come in. Um, it's a protagonist in itself. It, it literally represents um, God and effectively conveys to us the transcendence of the, of the saint, of St. Francis. So this is the direct artistical heritage that um, Giorgione got. He also would have seen things, works of art and artists as well, from um, all over Europe and Italy were present in Venice. On the left, you can see a painting by Hieronymus Bosch um, in the Ducal Palace in Venice. This is one of those painters from the Low Country who actually started using oil paints before uh, most painters in Italy. On the right, you see um, a, a portrait of a Venetian girl by Albrecht de Durer, Teutonic realism, looking into Venice. And then on the bottom, you see a sheet by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo actually came through Venice, as did um, Durer, and they probably met. We know also that Leonardo came, he had a, quite his quaderno, he had a, um, his folder with drawings with him. So it's easy, uh, it may be that um, Giorgione actually saw these, um, these kinds of works of art by these other artists. So he's kind of, obviously as a young artist, he's kind of soaking in all of, um, all of these various influences. This is one of his very earliest works. This is an altarpiece that was done, our earliest work that we know about. We really don't have any documents about him. I mean, almost zero. Um, we presume this is one of his relatively early works. It's an altarpiece for the Duomo in Castel Franco Veneto, which is his hometown. It already shows evidence of uh, uh, Bernini, uh, Bellini, excuse me. So he's been in the workshop of Bellini and he's asked to paint this altarpiece and he creates this um, kind of lovely Sacra Conversazione in kind of an interesting way. Um, he has raised the Madonna and Child up almost on this very high platform. He's um, using, you know, high Renaissance canons here to make sort of the, you know, a nice sort of solid triangular bit of the composition. Um, he has the Sacra Conversazione, there are two saints there. 
Um, notice how the saints are kind of in our space, which is on this side of that red wall. And notice that great open landscape in the back. Um, Bellini really um, worked on um, kind of creating these um, figures. And then the idea of having that landscape in the background um, was something that was quite present. Giorgione really kind of runs with that. So here in this instance, what he's done is, it's definitely a presence in the background, kind of this idyllic landscape. What's interesting though, is that the two male saints can't even see it. They have that red wall behind them. So the only figures who are actually uh, participating in this kind of idyllic landscape are um, the holy figures of um, the Madonna and the Christ child. So in a way, he's kind of given this idea of sacrality to the, to the landscape. He's also, there's actually no architecture here. So instead of that, the, you know, the niche with the golden dome, Mary and the Christ child are actually in, um, in uh, the landscape. Uh, again, kind of creating that sacred idea of the landscape. Look at the way he's painted um, the figures. You can see he's kind of got those hazy out, the hazy contours. There's no strict outline to the figures. He's really working on color. And we're gonna take a look at how he uses color um, he practices what is called tonalism. And in this instance, you can really see, for example, how he modeled the red drapery of the Madonna. You can also see how the colors of the entire composition are very well balanced. And he seems to have given Mary a green robe um, in order to kind of keep everything balanced, her green um, kind of uh, dress. Generally, Mary's dressed in blue. In this instance, she's in green. So that's a little bit odd. Um, I kind of wonder if it's, something to do with how much money he had to spend on materials. That could easily be, the, the blue paint was extremely expensive. So sometimes um, choices of color were made um, also because of the budget. Um, notice as well um, that the anatomy is a little questionable here. Both of the figures here, these two, you can kind of see it uh, the best. Um, their torso and legs are kind of connected. I'm not sure how, the, the anatomy is not perfect. Mary's head's even a little bit too small for her body. Um, so it's not that he didn't know what he was doing. It's just that wasn't the focus here. The focus was on color. It was on the landscape. It was on kind of presenting this kind of sacred, idyllic scene. Um, so the, the anatomy is a little bit sketched in, a little bit rough, and that's kind of typical of uh, Venetian painting, actually. And that's one of the things that sets it apart from uh, Florentine painting. And we'll look at that more closely in a moment. Here is a painting that was done slightly later. It's a much smaller composition. It's the Nativity it's in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Notice that um, a good half of the composition is now given over to that landscape. So there's a really interesting um, use of light in that there are two, if not three, even light sources. Um, Mary and the Christ child kind of glow from within. And then there's a light source on the upper left that comes down onto the three male figures. Um, and then the landscape itself kind of has its own thing going on, this kind of almost sunset type land, uh, light. Notice that there's hardly any shadows. There's sort of the bare minimum of shadows, just kind of what you have to have to make sure that the figure doesn't just look flat. The landscape really has almost no shadows, which kind of really gives it this kind of almost mysterious meditative quality. So the idea here is that this is more, more than, it's not so much of a narrative painting as it is a painting for contemplation. So this is a small panel um commissioned by a private patron and most likely it was in fact for contemplation and if you notice the cave in the background that could very much be which is the cave behind the holy family here where the um where the cows are that could very much also be an allusion to the um, cave of Plato. So the, the idea in Plato, and they, they were discussing this in these kind of studiolo type um, cultural salons there in Venice. Um, the idea is that you come out of the cave, come out of the darkness into the light with the revelation of the divine. So in this case, it's been turned into a religious image. So it's quite possible that that's what's going on. We're always kind of guessing with Giorgione because we really don't know exactly what is going on in a lot of his paintings. Um, Again, these paintings were done for private patrons. They kind of had a handshake agreement for their commissions. They are, there's not a lot of stuff on paper, so we don't really know what's going on. Um, a lot of times the meanings have been lost. And in this case, for example, the meaning has been lost. It's been poured over by art historians for centuries, and they still don't know what's going on. 
Um, this was painted for um, Gabriele Benjamin, who was um, a member of one of these um, important patrician families, um, kind of you know, one of these families who founded um, the Republic of Venice back in 421 AD. Um, <clears throat> He had a studio. He had an art collection. He kind of he kind of had one of these salons going on in his house. This is his house here. This is Cavendramin at Santa Fosca. It's actually a hotel. So next time y'all come to Venice, you can stay in Cavendramin. This is where this little painting called the Tempest Tongue. It's now in the Galleria dell'Accademia in Venice. Um, so Vendramin requested that Giorgione paint this image of something. Surely there was an agreement between them. And Vendramin knew what he wanted and Giorgione knew what he was doing, but um, the meaning has been lost to us today. So we don't exactly know what's going on here. Um, what we do know is that there's a storm. You can actually see that lightning bolt. So think about the moment being represented here. Lightning has just struck. There's kind of it's that moment before the thunder strikes, before it rains, there's this sultry atmosphere. The colors are just kind of soaked in humidity themselves. Notice how the whole, um, composition gets wider as it goes back into space and you have this just kind of odd um set of characters there's this woman who's nursing a child on a riverbank and then she's kind of looking out towards us and then there's this gentleman in finery basically he's been called a shepherd because he has the staff he's been called a soldier but he's literally kind of a young venetian dandy um we don't really know what's going on here um it may have come from a poem by Lucretius, who wrote a lot about the laws of nature. It could have come from a poem glorifying the Vendramin family. Um, in any event, the idea, though, is that, again, the landscape here is really the protagonist, not so much the figures. And there's this overall kind of idea of, this, of the mood of time suspended. Here are a couple of details. What's really interesting about this painting, and you can see here that Giorgione is working in oil paints, and he's working um, from a dark ground and then adding the lights on later. It's kind of the reverse the way a lot of painters work. A lot of painters uh, work from a light ground and then add the darks on top of that. And then he's working in oils. Oil paint dries very slowly. And just because of the consistency of the paint, you can also, you can kind of work with it, mix colors, actually mix it on the canvas. Um, you can also change your mind and paint over or scrape off. It's very, uh, kind of a very forgiving medium. So what Giorgione has done is, he has started to paint freestyle from life using the colors directly on the canvas with no underdrawing. And that is sort of a revolution here. And we know that he did that because um, we do actually have a couple documents where people mention it. It was kind of a big deal. They wrote it down. We also have an x-ray of this painting. So here's the Tempest that we just saw. And here's an x-ray of the Tempest. So notice on the left how it looks a little different. Um, he originally painted a female figure with her feet there in that little pool that's um, fed by the stream. He decided he didn't like that and just painted over it and put in the Venetian dandy on top of it. So the idea that he is creating as he goes um, is extreme novelty and not necessarily appreciated by the art historians down in Florence, where the Renaissance was invented um, using a whole different set of principles. Uh, but it's working for Giorgione. So here's another um, sort of type of painting that he does. This sort of um, half-length figure behind a parapet. This was also done um, for the patron Gabriele Vendramin. Clearly another um, kind of a meditative painting, a painting that was done for contemplation. This is not necessarily a person. This is an allegory of time. She's holding uh, the little tag that says cold tempo with time. Um, she's known as La Vecchia, the old woman. Um, and you can see um, other aspects of the way that Giorgione paints. So not only is he working in oils, he's actually painting on canvas. And it's a very rough weave canvas. Um, that was preferred in Venice because the constant humidity of the atmosphere in Venice causes frescoes to degrade. It actually causes wooden panels to warp and just ruin the paintings that they're painted on. Um, those were the preferred materials and medium um, in uh, central uh, central Italy. Um, but because of the problems with the humidity in Florence, they started painting on um, canvas. And very interestingly, they didn't prepare the canvas to make it slick as if it were a panel. They actually kind of left it rough. And you can kind of see that. Um, you can kind of see the weave of the canvas. And you can also see how when Giorgione came over with his thick white highlights, it kind of 
the painting, the paint's almost broken. It doesn't smoothly cover the surface. And you can really see that here in her cap. Here's another example of that. This is called uh, Laura. It's at the Kunsthistorisches Museum in Vienna. Tiny little panel, it's 16 by 13 inches. Um, it was commissioned by someone called Giacomo. Um, Giorgione wrote that on the back and he wrote the date 1506. So we know this is Laura. We don't know who Laura is. We presume she's an allegory as well. Most Venetian women are not gonna be topless in their portraits. So we're pretty sure it's not um, a Venetian uh, patrician woman. I could be wrong. Um, it may be an allegory for something. It could also be um, Petrarch's unattainable love, Laura, Laura. We're not sure. Um, but we have though, is this absolutely luscious, luscious portrait of this woman. She's wearing this amazing, um, red velvet drape with the you know, fur lining, and she has this spray of laurel branches behind her. And in typical fashion, Giorgione has painted directly on the canvas with colors without doing huge, uh, you know, in-depth um, drawing studies. And you can see how he's kind of working the paint on that rough weave canvas. You can see the weave of the canvas. He's got a, he started from a dark ground and then built the lights up for He was finishing the painting. He was using alternately very thin paint with a tiny little brush to do things like the highlights here on the leaves of the laurel, um, the laurel plant. And he was also using kind of thick paint um, with a thicker brush to put on highlights. Look at her fingers. You kind of see how he just kind of slapped on some highlights here. Again, that thick impasto doesn't even, it's not able to even go down inside of the, um, kind of the texture of the canvas, so it kind of floats on top. And then look at how he modeled her face. This is what's so kind of breakthrough Afri Porta trailblazer about Giorgione. He created, he modeled her face by creating shadows, not by putting on layers of ever darker glazes. He literally mixed colors. So he's working with different tones of the same color. So he's, look at how he modeled her mouth. He's literally using um different hues of the same flesh tone in order to kind of model her mouth and make it look very natural and there's there are absolutely no hard lines here she looks very kind of soft and naturalistic here she is from a distance again such a beautiful painting and a very interesting painterly style um, the florentines referred to this as pittura di macchia painting in spots as if it were just like these spots of paint were just smashed onto the canvas um, a later art historian, Vasari, who was writing in the 1560s, um, actually had to explain it. And he, he was trying to explain to his readers what this was. He said, they're painting with spots and they paint with these blobs. And if you're up close, you can't tell what it is. And then when you're far away, it actually makes sense. Like he actually had to go and explain that to them because this painterly technique was um, just not known. And it wasn't known because in Florence, the ideal was kind of concentrated on this very intellectual approach to form, structure, anatomy, and all this was done with drawing. So their style was quite graphic. This is Michelangelo's Doni Tondo, which was painted in 1506, the exact same year that Giorgione painted the Laura. This is in the collection of the Uffizi here in Florence. Um, this is one of, you know, Michelangelo was mostly a sculptor, but he, as you know, painted the Sistine ceiling in fresco. We're gonna look at that in a second. And he did, this is his only panel painting. This is Tempera Grassa on panel. Um, and you can see, I think you can tell that he has taken this kind of approach that's very graphic. Um, he would have done um, drawing studies and um, uh, underdrawing on the canvas before he went in and kind of painted it in. And you can see here that he has kind of, you know, made his composition. He's actually drawn the figures, figured out where all the shadows are gonna go, and then he comes and puts the color on. And it's also this very, um, it's on panel and it's, um, done in gesso to just a high polish. So the finished product has this kind of slick polish, kind of a sealed surface. If you think about um, the rough surface of Laura, he's also using cool colors, very sharp contours. There's not a hint of a brush stroke here. There's no atmosphere in here either. Like that, that sultry humidity, there is none of that. Here's a good kind of example of um, one way that Michelangelo used drawing. This is the Libyan Sibyl, what you see on the right, which is on uh, part of the Sistine um, Chapel ceiling. And you can see his preparatory drawing 
on the left, he literally drew the figure nude in order to get the anatomy perfect before he closed the church. That was very important to him. It was important to the Florentines. So drawing and design were kind of this intellectual, rational approach to painting. It was also necessary when painting in both temper and fresco because those are kind of unforgiving mediums and they um, dry very quickly and you don't have room for mistakes. Um, also in fresco painting, especially in these enormous figures that are on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, that uh, Libyan Sibyl was done in 17 days, 17 days of work. So he had to know what was happening up there so that he could kind of put together these 17 days like a puzzle piece and make it turn out right. Um, Giorgione just did not work like that. He worked, um, you know, kind of more um, luxuriously in his oil paints. He also did some drawings. This is a drawing by um, Giorgione from the Met in New York. Um, it's kind of an idea. This is an idea of a Cupid. This was going to go on the exterior of that building called Fondaco dei Tedeschi, which we'll look at in a moment. You can see the anatomy here is not really correct either. This certainly is not something, he's not going to actually paint this exactly the way he's drawn it. It's kind of an idea that in that niche, he's going to, there's going to be a Cupid. And this is what it's going to look like. It's very kind of loose. We don't have many drawings. We don't have many documents. We don't have many drawings about Giorgione. Here's a very interesting one. It was actually discovered recently, kind of within the last decade. Um, you would think that they would have already figured this out. This is, uh, was discovered in a copy of um, Dante's Divine Comedy in Sydney, Australia, in a rare book library. And um, there happens to be a Giorgione scholar called Janie Anderson there. Um, and she has actually attributed this drawing to Giorgione and thinks that perhaps that edition of the Divine Comedy actually belonged to Giorgione. What's really cool about this, um, A is the drawings. We have so few drawings by Giorgione. It would be cool if this actually were by him. And then there's that um, note there at the top of the page, which is actually a note of Giorgione's death. And what it does is it provides us a birth date for Giorgione. We had guessed on his birth date, and this backs it up by about five years. Um, and it's dated 1510. You can kind of see that at the top, it's been cut, but. So 1510, and it says on 17 of September, Zorzo da Castel Franco morì. He died of the plague. He was uh, a fintore eccellentissimo, a most excellent painter in Venice, and he died at age 36. May he rest in peace. So um, that's kind of a big deal that we can actually date him uh, back a couple years, which means he would have reached artistic maturity a little bit earlier than we thought. All right, so keeping in mind this idea of drawing, obviously this is a very rough sketch in red chalk. This is kind of an idea for some eventual Madonna and child uh, by Giorgione. Um, another painter contemporary in um, Florence is Leonardo da Vinci. And this is Leonardo da Vinci's unfinished adoration of the Magi um, in the Uffizi here in Florence. And you can really see the extent of his underdrawing. This is the underdrawing that, that Leonardo did before he laid the color down. Um, so you can see how much time he spent on this. And so imagine how different that is from how Giorgione is working by just going to a blank canvas and getting at it with the colors. I'm going to show you a couple more Leonardo works. This one, um, this is Ginevra da Vinci in the collection of the National Gallery of Art in Washington. This is kind of an early work by Leonardo. It was begun in 1474, which is the year we believe Giorgione was born. Um, he's working in oil here, oil on panel, but he's still doing the underdrawing. You can actually see the underdrawing in her eye there. So I put the close up of her eye. You can see the pencil line um, through the oil paints. This picture was commissioned by the Venetian ambassador to Florence, Bernardo Bembo, and was in Florence. And Giorgione may have known this painting. He may also have met Leonardo when he was there in March of 1500. We know that Giorgione was there in 1500. Um, he actually, that's one of the only documents we have for him. He wrote to his hometown. He had a notary send a note to the hometown saying, please exempt me from taxes. I'm no longer a resident. So we have that. We know that by 1510, he was an official resident of Venice and may have in fact met Leonardo. So this is a painting by Leonardo done in um, when he was about 24 years old. He is kind of working in more of a almost Flemish style, kind of that very kind of polished um, skin of the figure. He moves on um, throughout his career and really kind of starts to um, use a more exaggerated type of chiaroscuro, which of course is what he's using here for um, the Mona Lisa. This was begun in 1503 and he kind of legendarily worked on it for the rest of his life. So 1503 is quite close to the 1506 of the uh, Laura painting by 
um, um, Giorgione. So there's a lot to say about this painting, but we're talking about Giorgione and we're going to look at um, kind of how they both used um, their different um, style, styles to model the faces. So Leonardo, first of all, the paint surface is now kind of marred by this crack allure, but it would have been a very smooth, smooth paint surface. And you can see that he's using um, just lots of layers, kind of dark glazes, kind of um, to build up the kind of shadowy areas in order to uh, model the face and also kind of blur um, the outlines of the features. There's no, he has no hard contours here um, opposed, as opposed to Michelangelo. Um, he really uses what he calls sfumatura. And he does it with these dark glazes, which is totally different to what um, Giorgione was doing. So as we said, Giorgione was actually using darker hues of the same color in order to model the facial, facial features. And um, Leonardo is using his sort of famous chiaro scuro to give um, both beautiful but very different results. So quick look at a, another landscape painting by Giorgione. This is interesting for two reasons. Um, this is a sunset. It's now in the collection of the National Gallery in London. It has been heavily, heavily restored. Um, and what this kind of shows is that the kind of almost desperation of collectors who want to have a Giorgione. He created so few works. He died at an extremely young age. Um, as soon as he died, people tried to buy his paintings. None of his collectors would sell them. Isabella Deste wanted one of his paintings and could not get one. You could not get your hands on a Giorgione. Um, even today, you know, big museums want to have a Giorgione and the National Gallery in London bought this one um, in the early part of the early um, part of the 1900s, and their conservator wrote a really in-depth article about the conservation history of this painting. It was literally ruined, um, but because it was a Giorgione original, somebody somewhere along the along the line um, managed to patch it together with bits of canvas from other old paintings. You can see how much all of this part, all of this here, is not original paint. Um, so in order to kind of make this be a finished painting and actually, you know, sell it as a Giorgione, um, she actually, the conservator at the National Gallery of London calls it Giorgione and not Giorgione. Um, but you still you see it's clearly one of the classic, idyllic Arcadian landscape by uh, Giorgione. And the other interesting bit is that in part of the original paint, she found a fingerprint. And there's Giorgione's fingerprint, which you see there on the upper right. And that's right on this tower that's in the distance here. And he seems to have kind of smudge the paint a little bit to kind of make it a little bit more hazy so it actually seems as if it's in the far distance. So that's a nice little bit of sympathetic magic. Giorgione's fingerprint comes down to us today. So Giorgione has spent all of this time working on relatively small canvases for private uh, patrons. He finally gets a big commission in 1507 to paint what's called a telero or basically a big canvas for the interior of the Palazzo Ducale. Uh, Unfortunately, that's now lost, but here you can see the building. It's kind of a big deal. So the um, the government commissioned him to paint a large painting. That was kind of a, a breakthrough in his uh, career. Unfortunately, the painting was lost. In that same year, he was asked, uh, again, the government of Venice gave him the commission to decorate the exterior of the Fondaco dei Tedeschi. This is the, um, it's Fondaco dei Tedeschi. Um, it's the headquarters of the German nation and at the port of Venice. It had, um, the building had burned, it was built back, um, and it was ready to be decorated in 1507-1508. So again, Giorgione was given this commission. Um, notice the position of this building. This is the Fondico dei Tedeschi here. It's on the Grand Canal at the end of the Rialto Bridge. So this is the most prominent location in all of Venice, except for maybe the exterior of the Palazzo Ducale. Um, a more prominent location was hardly possible um, in Venice. Here's some more views. So that kind of, the fact that he was given that commission, you can see that this is the facade of the building here, here, and then it's right here. So from the Grand Canal, you, I mean, it's just visible from um, far away even as you're approaching Rialto Bridge. So this kind of signals that Giorgione had been chosen to succeed Giovanni Bellini as the um, kind of state painter for the Serenissima, for the Republic of Venice. So unfortunately, again, he died just several years later and was not able to take that, um, take on that role. His student, Tiziano Vecellio, who we know as Titian, did take on that role. And Titian was actually involved in um, the decoration of the Fondico dei Tedeschi. So this is 
um, mature work of Giorgione. Unfortunately, late, it ends up being sort of one of his last works since he didn't uh, live very long, and then very early work for Titian. Um, again, that was a fresco on the outside of a building in Venice, and it just didn't hold up. And this is what's left today. This is what we have of what uh, Giorgione did. Um, we can see it's a classicizing figure, and he's using his wonderful warm tones, and he's kind of modeling the figure with um, the tonal gradations like we've just looked at. And you know this figure sort of seems to be anyway, just sort of coming out of the mist, although we can't really be sure because it's in such terrible shape. Um, we know this when when this when this decoration went up, it kind of caused a stir, and people came from all over the place to look at them. People even came from went to from Florence to Venice to see these things. Um, they were also in various states of degradation, um, etched by various artists, and so the fame kind of spread around Europe by these etchings. Um, that had been done from the building. So these are this is Giorgione, and then this is what we have of Titian. Titian painted not the, not the not the Grand Canal uh, facade, but the the smaller um, side facade. This is um, we think Judith. It's it looks like Judith at the head of Holofernes. If this is uh, from the um, earlier engraving, and it's a little bit more almost like dynamic, more of a dynamic composition. Than, George, than Giorgione usually does. And that's kind of typical of Titian. There's always been kind of a hard time telling um, of the difference between um, mature Giorgione and early Titian because Titian's job was to paint like Giorgione and he did it really well. So here's uh, one of those classic examples of a painting that's been hard to um, attribute to either one of the artists. This is the pastoral concert, it's in the Louvre. Um, it's currently given to Titian. And because of the kind of dynamic figural group and the way they're kind of pressed up close to the picture plane, it does look a lot like Titian, but the landscape is so Giorgione-esque. And then look at this figure here. She just looks so Giorgione, doesn't she? Um, they may have worked on it together. Um, they sometimes did that. For example, here, um, this actually was, both hands are present in this painting, but it's because Giorgione died before he completed it, unfortunately. So this was um, a commission from um, Gir Girolamo Marcello for the Sleeping Venus. This was kind of a breakthrough in its own um, because of the composition. This is the first time in Western painting that a uh, female nude has been um, kind of the main protagonist of a painting and it's enormous. It's um, 175 centimeters by 108 centimeters. That's 69 by 42 and a half inches. So it's quite a large panel. Um, it's typical Giorgione with this sort of lovely um, sleeping figure, you know, kind of idyllic and dreaming with that lovely soft landscape behind her. Notice how the landscape even um, kind of mimics the curves of her body. It's quite beautiful. It actually makes me think of Modigliani if you think about it. And I think we might have seen this when we talked about Modigliani. Um, this became kind of a standard type for centuries to come. So this is the first time that a female reclining nude was shown kind of in this way. Titian did the same thing later, 1538. Other painters did it as well. And here's Manet's version, 1863 in the Musée d'Orsay. Um, really just so you can kind of connect the dots all the way down to Manet. Manet was very interested in Giorgione and Titian. You can kind of see too how he, his painterly technique kind of um, is somewhat similar to Giorgione's. He actually also, Manet studied um, the pastoral concert. So it had a lot of, kind of a large effect on um, those, the artists in France in the 1860s. So Titian, um, kind of takes over um, on Giorgione's death and, um, becomes the state painter for Venice. And he's the proponent of Giorgione's style. And he kind of adds to it, obviously, his own thing. So he has a lot of, he adds kind of energy and more kind of dynamic black and white almost to Giorgione's very sultry kind of undertone tonalism. Um, Titian reigned supreme. He had a very long career and he was kind of, he was the man in Venice. And he painted all sorts of amazing canvases for all sorts of um, patrons religious paintings, mythological paintings. This is uh, Dane in the Prado in Madrid. This is a portrait. He was a great portraitist. This is the portrait of Doge Andrea Gritti in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. 
and here you can really see um, how he even took even farther that idea of open brushwork and how much energy he puts into that very open brushwork. And you can see why Vasari really is just Vasari, the Florentine art historian, just he looks, you know, I, you can imagine him just looking at that, looking at all this kind of broken brushwork and saying, you know, Pittura di Macchia, they're just patent spots, you know, and if from up close, you can't even see what it is, you have to back up and then it all makes sense. Like, that was just sort of completely not in his mindset. But against this very painterly technique as um, opposed to the very kind of graphic technique, this um, kind of the the chain from Bellini to Giorgione to Titian um, goes on and you can kind of follow it through Western art. And you can see some of the legacy here um, of Giorgione and also Titian, El Greco, Rembrandt, Manet, and then I mean, it's gonna be a stretch, but I'm taking the tonalism on to um, Child Hassan, Fifth Avenue, New York in the 1890s. And then Giorgio Morandi, who's the great um, 20th century Italian painter. This from, I believe the Fondazione Magnani Rocca the picture on the lower right. So let's go back to Giorgione's hometown. And here's Castel Franco Veneto. This is this walled city. The walls are from the 1200s and here inside of the wall, the, the ramparts. So Giorgione was born here and the Zisola family had an osteria and um, the Evelina Zisola invented the dessert we're about to make. And we're also gonna make uh, Rizzi a Bizi. So I'm gonna go into the kitchen. So we're gonna make rice and peas, which is the kind of a traditional springtime dish of the event. They actually have um, risaie, they grow rice, um, specifically violone nano rice, which is what we're gonna cook with. So we're, I'm gonna get the rice going. It's interesting in that it's kind of a soupy, brothy type of a dish. It's not a risotto which makes it a little bit different. Um, when you think of Italian rices, I think a lot of people, a lot of people kind of think um, risotto. I need to break this down a little bit. Va bene, va bene, va bene. Okay, si vede tutto sì. la. Sì, sì. Okay, accendo un po' di cose. So let's see, let me get this going. What's really interesting about this dish, it's basically rice and peas, which sounds, you know, sort of simple. Um, and I guess it kind of is in a way. But what's cool about it is that we actually use the uh, pea pods. Not just the piece, but also the pods. Um, so that makes it kind of different. Um, so I have already kind of gotten going for us some white spring onion. So here are the ingredients for the rice and peas. Uh, white spring onion and some pancetta, which is kind of, it's not smoked bacon. Um, I kind of thick cut and I just cut it into dadini, little tiny squares. So the onions I have cooked in a mix of butter and olive oil. They do use, I just kind of brown, not just kind of, they just started to turn translucent. Um, this is a very good kind of springtime dish with very nice fresh flavor. So you don't want to kind of cook everything until it's crispy. I kind of, I generally like to caramelize onions, but not in this dish. Um, I'm also going to just kind of barely warm really the pancetta. You don't want to cook it like it's crispy like bacon. You just want to cook it until it just kind of starts to go translucent. So I'm going to go ahead and add that. And then I'll show you what we do with the peas. So the peas is kind of this curious recipe. So these, of course, are fresh peas. Um, and um, when you peel the peas, shuck the peas, you keep the pods. And the pods get boiled in vegetable broth and then they get pureed and that's what you cook the rice in. So you get this very, very just kind of permeating good pea flavor. It's not heavy at all. Um, and it's just really interesting because whoever knew you could eat a pea pod. Um, the thing about them is they're a little bit fibrous. And so I, to peel, to shuck them, I actually try to, you know, as if it was a string bean and try to peel the string off just to kind of get rid of as much um, of the fiber as possible. So they get, again, boiled for 30 minutes. And I just kind of get floppy. So I'll show you what happens to them. This is the only recipe I know of that uses this. Uh, again, we have some question about the spring onions. Uh, 
Uh -huh. Because uh, uh, Suzanne says this is scallion. Uh, it's not a scallion. No, I don't know. It's an onion. And uh, uh, it's a green onion. <laughs> it's a, it's it's a green new onion. fresh green onion. Uh, and uh, Liz Loveland say uh, if you can uh, work, if you can use wild garlic, but the garlic is very different. About I actually, in this recipe, I think I would just use a little bit of white onion, even just regular dried onion. Um, it's a very, there's three ingredients in here and it's kind of particular and I actually generally avoid onion at all costs, but the onion here is actually really good. And so um, I would, I would choose to use actual, just a, an onion, like a, you know, it's a regular old white dried onion as opposed to garlic. Um, or you can try scallions too though. I think you can use a, a white onion if you don't have yeah. fresh onion. Okay, I agree. But, I agree. All right, so here are the pea pods that have been boiling for 30 minutes. And can y'all see that in the broth? I don't see? know if y'all can really see that so good. Okay, yeah. good. So I'm going to... It's only the shell. Right, it's just the pods. So the peas, here are the peas. The peas are here. The pods are there. I picked through them. You know, sometimes the pods, not all the pods were beautiful. So the ones that weren't so pretty, um, I discarded them. So I just kept the ones, the, the prettier of the um, pea pods. And I'm going to just whir them up with an immersion blender. This is so funny. Um, so again, it's quite fibrous. So you kind of have to work at it um, to get the immersion blender to actually blend everything. I hope this isn't too loud. What does the dimmy take the phone? Possiamo supportare. Okay, good. So you have to be a little careful not to splash all over the place. And you also sometimes have to stop in the middle and clean out some of the fiber from the blade. of the most involved part of this recipe. Once you've done this, it basically just cooks itself. All right, I think I have them all. Let me get rid of this. Um, so because there are some fibery bits, you have to pass it through a sieve. But this is the most involved part of this recipe. It gets really easy from here. And the recipe is interesting. This is, um, they eat it all throughout the Veneto in spring. I'm gonna pass this through a sieve and remove the fibery parts. So they eat this in Veneto in spring. And it's traditional to eat on the Feast of San Marco, which is the 25th of um, April. April. So, and the tradition is that uh, peas from Istria, which is part of the uh, Venetian Republic. Um, peas from Istria were sent to the Doge. So this was made for the Doge. And it was made with, again, rice that was cultivated in the Veneto. But rice was brought in uh, by the Arabs. And the idea of eating rice mixed with vegetables or other things, um, or even using it as a stuffing sometimes, is quite um, common in the Byzantine world. So they think this recipe does come from the Byzantine dominion. And influence anyway there in Venice. So I'm just pushing everything that I can through the sieve. This is how much fiber is coming out, but it's almost, it's kind of funny because it looks a little bit like split pea soup, but it's not, it's much fresher tasting. It's actually, it's just amazingly fresh tasting. You put only water or so salt? Um, I am gonna add salt in a minute. So this is cooked. I'm going to add the peas and a little bit of water. And kind of let them go for a second. Just the peas need to kind of just get, get going before you add the the pie broth. Susanna asks if spring onion have a strong flavor. No, it's very mild. 
It's very, very mild, but it's still onion. It's it's very much onion and not garlic. So. And you you don't use anymore, so it's very little. It's very what? It's not a lot of onions, so you don't put a lot of onions. Right, it's not a lot of onion. Again, nothing is super cooked in here. Everything kind of kind of boils together, so it's not like I said, it's not kind of caramelized. I'm gonna go ahead and add the um, the pea broth. And then as soon as that comes to a boil, I'm going to add the rice. And at that point, you just cook the rice and you're done. And I'll show you what that looks like. So the idea is that it's kind of a soup. It's not a risotto at all. It's more of a, it's not a soup. It's kind of, it's, it's, as they say, they say it's brodozo. It's brothy. They eat that a lot up in Veneto. They eat things that are brothy. So as soon as that boils, I'm going to add the rice. And in the meantime, I'm going to put together this dessert, which is the brisolona or fregiolota from Evelina Zisola. So the word brisolona means crumbly, and that's what this is. This dessert, it's crumbly when you make it, it's crumbly when you cook it, and it's crumbly when you eat it. And it's super good. And it's um, really kind of just kind of some very few basic ingredients. I have here just some flour and sugar. I'm going to put in a pinch of salt, kind of a big pinch of salt. It's not a super sweet dessert, and it kind of goes nicely with um, kind of a good amount of salt. And the key here is toasted almonds. So a very kind of just gently toasted, some very coarsely chopped almonds. I'm gonna add them. So this all gets tossed up with a little bit of lemon zest. Here's my zester. So I'm gonna mix this together. And then if you can see the pea broth is boiling. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the, add the rice. Again, this is Vialone Nano rice. This is a very short grain rice, tiny little short grain rice. You could also use this for risotto. This is what we're making now is not a risotto, but um, you could in fact use this for risotto. I, this is my favorite rice. I always choose this whenever I can find it. It's kind of become hard to find for some reason. In Italy, I used to find it all the time in the grocery store, um, not anymore. So I actually ordered it from Ferron Rizai up in the Veneto and they sent it to my house. It's very convenient. All right, so this just needs to come back to a boil and then I'm gonna let, just let it simmer until the rice is done. So sort of 12, 15 minutes. And again, the hope is that it's kind of a soup. I, I think sbriciolona, sbrizolona. Uh -huh. See. Is the only dessert that uh, you fail if everything rests in the shape. Say that again, coming. Yeah, is the is the only dessert where you fail if everything if everything stays in shape. You need oh, that right. you have crumbling <laughs> every every time. Right, right, exactly. You've done something wrong if it if it doesn't if it doesn't fall apart. You've done something wrong. So it's supposed to fall apart, which makes it super forgiving. I'm using um, almonds from Sicily. Some, it's kind of just natural sugar. It's not, it's not brown sugar, but it's natural brown-ish sugar. And then I use a little bit of salt and I've used the heritage grain flour from my miller up the street. Now I'm just gonna pour in some melted butter. I also use lemon from my tree. So this is the simplest thing in the world, but a couple of good ingredients make it turn out nice. So just kind of vaguely try to mix everything up. It's not supposed to be perfect. 
And then what holds all this together is just some egg yolk. So it's still kind of, can y'all can, yeah, you can kind of see it's kind of crumbly. Um, I'm just going to mix the egg yolk in here. One. Come in. Only one. This is actually, I'm making a half recipe. This is one and a half egg yolks. It calls for three egg yolks. And you just kind of, it kind of gets lumpy. And that's kind of the point. Just kind of mix it up until it makes kind of these big chunks. And then it gets baked in kind of a warm, not hot oven. So just under 180 or 350. And I'll, of course, send you the recipe tomorrow. And the only thing to really make sure you do here is use a buttered pan, because otherwise it will just, that egg, it'll just stick to a pan. You'll never get it out of there. So I have a buttered kind of a cake pan. And I'm just going to dump it in here. So you can see it's just all these clumps. And you don't press it in. It needs, it just, because it's crumbly, it's brisolana, you just take all these clumpy crumbles and just kind of spread them around and don't press it all. Just, just try to make sure that you can't see the bottom anywhere. Just make sure the clumps kind of are distributed evenly and there's no gaps. So you're not looking at the bottom of the pan. And then it miraculously, because of the egg yolk, um, just kind of all comes together. All right, so that's good enough. I'm just going to stick it in the oven. So then it gets baked in a kind of warm oven for 40 minutes. All right, so this rice is going. I've, of course, got some already made. So I'm going to show you all what that looks like. So when you finish the rice, rice, by the way, continues to absorb liquid like crazy when you turn off the pan. And so I actually just added a little bit more broth um, to make it so that it wasn't too thick. So to finish the rice, you add a little chunk of butter. So this is a this is a recipe from the Veneto, right? So it's not all olive oil. I used a little bit of olive oil in there, but I'm going to finish it off with some butter, um, a sprinkle of parsley, and then just a little bit of Parmesan cheese. I'm going to swap burners here, too. OK. So this one, because it's been sitting here while we were talking about Giorgione, um, has absorbed so much liquid, it almost looks like a risotto. But I'll show I'll show you what it looks like. Um, it's not kind of as dense as a risotto. I wouldn't mind if it was a little bit looser. In fact, I'm going to add have a little bit of kind of weak weak pea broth. I'm going to add that so I get a better consistency. This whole thing starts with just a simple vegetable broth. I literally boiled carrot, celery, parsley, and onion. Um, so you can always keep a little bit of that on hand to um, use to, to dilute if necessary. So this is one of these things. It's kind of like I said, it's not a soup. It's just brothy. It's got very, just great, very very, very fresh flavors. Nothing is kind of cooked too long. The pea pods are amazingly fresh and kind of spring-like. Um, so, and it's kind of, this is what the consistency they call al onda. It kind of spreads out in the pan and your plate. And you can, this is a piatto fondo, which we use a lot in Italy for um, first courses. And you can just eat this with a spoon. And there you go, spring. I'm gonna put a little more cheese on top, a little more Parmigiano. Uh, this also is super good with white pepper. So all of y'all who went out and got white pepper last time we used it, this is an excellent um, use for that. You want me to taste it for salt? I added a bunch of Parmesan cheese and my broth was a little salty-ish, so 
um, I went ahead and did not add more salt, but y'all might want to taste for seasoning. So there's that. And then I'll show you how this dessert looks. Um, it's kind of funny, our crumbly dessert, the crumble. We also have a question of, of, uh, about the dessert, but I say you after. No, no, go ahead. Okay, Kathy mm -hmm. asked if there are some variation in the dessert recipe, for example, adding dried fruits. Oh, the only variation I know of is the one they make in Mantua, uh, Mantua, which is, um, has, um, they use cornmeal instead of flour. That's the only variation that I know of. So it's not really ever going to come out in good pieces. Like Lorenzo said, if it comes out in a whole piece, then you've done something wrong. So this is how you serve this. It's crumbly. Hence the name. There you go. Brisolon. Any more questions? Y'all can open your mic if you want and say, hey. Ooh. It looks as Ooh. if that would be delicious over gelato or with gelato. <laughs> That's actually quite a good idea. Yeah. Actually, now that you mentioned it. Well, everything is good with gelato. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. Also, easy and busy. <laughs> oh, yes. And thanks for the vegetarian recipe. You know, so often I, I feel kind of out of the loop when you do you know, start. Well, I wouldn't add the pancetta. That would be, you can, I don't know. Yeah, you can skip that. That's a little I extra. Think, oh, you know, I would. Oh, yummy. Mm. <laughs> Yeah. But the thing yours. about using, I love using the um, pea pods. Oh, another thing I meant to tell you, I was, I was, I tried to find organic peas because I thought if I'm gonna eat the pods, they need to be organic. And I kind of beat my head against a brick wall. Could not find any organic peas for various reasons, most of which have to do with the weather around here. Um, peas in Tuscany are about a month behind, so the people, the people I know who grow the peas don't have any. But a, a farmer, a vegetable farmer, you know, a actual vegetable farmer, told me that anything that has a gusto like that, you really don't have to worry about what's on the, the basically, they probably um, fertilized it from the roots and, but there's nothing, you know, um, oh. no shiva, what's the word? And there's nothing harmful, harmful yeah. on the out exterior of the pod. So I washed them really well. I just kind of rinsed them through water and let them sit for a few minutes in water before I boiled them. Um, without really worrying about whether they were organic or not. So organic is probably a better bet, but um, you can still eat your, your pea pods, even if they're not. Um, so I hope y'all will try that out. It is a really good fresh flavor and whoever would have thought. So. Oh no, it sounds wonderful. My favorite thing, rice. Oh, good. When do the, when do the peas go in? The peas go in between the um, pancetta and before the broth. So the peas actually cook for a few minutes by themselves before you put all of that green broth in there. They kind of, you just kind of, you kind of give them a head start because it's, it actually doesn't cook very long. Once the, you know, the rice doesn't take very long to cook. So you want to give the peas a little bit of a head start. What is this the name is... of that rice? What? What is the name of the rice again? The, the rice, rice is Via Lone Nano. Where is it? Lo scritto nella Here chat. It is. Yeah, it's Via Lone Nano. And I have a source for y'all. Um, the folks who carry um, Sagona, our Sagona olive oil also have Via Lone Nano oh, rice. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to, I'll send you the link for that tomorrow. And they are giving um, temporary gift with purchase. So um, I'll send all information about making orders from Oleo to go and you can get the rice. Okay. And they will send you a present also. Can we see the Mm -hmm. can, can we see the dessert in a spoon or a little plate up close? Oh, sure. Here you go. I'll put it on blue. Oh, there you go. Can you see that pretty well? I can't, if I, if oh, I tilt it yes. anymore, it's going to land on my computer. It's just literally crumbly, literally just crumble. Mm. But it's so good. I mean, it's butter is what it is. Like, I, mean, I think I described it as shortbread. It's, it's like an almondy shortbread um, with some almonds in it. Yeah, I'll make it uh, with Lemon my dip. grandchildren for Mother's Day. I'll oh, make good. it small. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good idea. Do you good serve it warm or cool? Um, either way is fine. Um, probably room temperature is better. Uh, just kind of let it let it cool, but you can eat it. It would be a good warm as well. So, mm -hmm. the salty butter almond. Nothing wrong mm -hmm. with that. So. Very good. Oh yeah, butter. Y'all, thank you so much for tuning in. Oh. I'm happy to see everybody. Y'all, this is literally. Hang on, Lorenzo. We have to have a chin chin. All I have is water. Hang on a second. Oh. Lorenzo, do you have a glass? Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to take a glass. Wait. 
Um, Wait a minute. Okay, I was gonna say, first of all, I, I think I'm gonna drink some Prosecco with my Rizzi a Bizi because Prosecco <laughs> comes from the Veneto like the Rizzi and Bizi does. But um, actually, I don't know, we're not really allowed to do a chin chin with water, but I feel like we have to toast. It's our one year anniversary. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll do it with coffee, <laughs> chin chin. Oh good, all right, Suzanne, yeah, chin chin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so exciting. I love your shows. I think they're so interesting. I'm glad y'all awesome. enjoy them. I'm also, happy Mother's Day to all the moms yeah. out there. Happy Mother's Day to my mom. Happy, mom wine. happy Mother's yeah. Day. Hey, come here. <laughs> okay, Lorenzo, I know you have actually got wine. I don't have any wine. <laughs> Hang on, I have to add, you're not, you're not allowed, it's bad luck to chin chin with water. I'm going to add, look, I have some vermouth. Hang on a second. I'm just going to make this so I don't have bad luck. <laughs> so I'm I'm I, I have primitivo of manduria. Oh, oh, the wine. Oh, happy, happy, happy one year anniversary. Thank you so much. Mar thank marvelous you. presentation. Thank no, thanks thank to everybody you. for and, for and then being. sorry thank and you. happy uh, for all uh, Mother Day is tomorrow. So yes, happy yes. Mother Day. Yes, happy thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chin chin, merci beaucoup. Yo, thanks for being thank here. You. Prego, y'all. I hope to see y'all next time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.